And then I thought it would be appropriate to talk some about some New Year's resolutions. And of course, we know that's a popular topic always around this time of the year. Now, I don't know who started that. Why would anybody think about New Year's resolutions or, you know, that they need to, uh, at the beginning of a new year, start resolving to do certain things or not doing certain things? I, I don't know who the first person was who, who came up with that idea, but, but it's not a bad idea. And a lot of those tend to fall kind of by the wayside over a period of time as far as resolutions are concerned. Probably the most popular one would be to, uh, for people to try to lose weight. That's probably the number one resolution. And uh, that's one that, that sometimes people are very successful with. And if you look at your grocery stores, you'll notice there uh, all kinds of diets. And I was looking at the internet the other day and they had 32 popular diets that are out right now. And they have one where you're supposed to be able to lose nine pounds in 72 hours. And so, uh, which is impossible, you can't do that. You really can't lose more than two pounds in one week. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, that, that's one of the things that is kind of the, the thing right now. People talk about that every year, they do that. And sometimes those work, but most of the time that, you know, as soon as you run into something that tastes really good or, uh, you know, your willpower kind of fades away maybe in the middle of January, well, that one goes by the boards. And there are other resolutions people make too that sometimes we can stay with fairly faithfully, but a lot of times they, they may not stay with us too long either. But what I'd like to do this morning is take a look at Romans 12 and talk about some resolutions that we can look at that are spiritual in nature that can be a blessing in our life. Now, for a lesson like this to have any meaning whatsoever, you can just listen to it and say, well, that's another lesson and go home. Or you can take Romans 12, because that's where the power source is. It's not in me, certainly, but in the Bible. And you can take a look at Romans 12 and read it through a few times. At some point, when you have the opportunity to do that, include that maybe in your daily Bible reading. And I think it will cause you to, uh, it'll be blessing, a blessing for you to look at Romans 12 because there are many things inside of it. And in fact, I won't even be able to cover all of them. I'm just going to hit a few of them this morning in just a few minutes that we're going to be spending talking about this. So Romans chapter 12, by now you've turned to that. And so the first one we notice on there is that we should present our body as a living sacrifice. Maybe that could be one of our New Year's resolutions. I might also add that if you have your bulletin with you, most of these appear in the article that we have in the bulletin this week, one of the two articles that are centered around the New Year's. Uh, they may not go in the order that I'm going to be going in this morning or that Romans 12 does, but most of them you'll probably find in there. But in Romans 12, verse 1, what a great challenge that is. When you think about that presenting your body as a living sacrifice, the, the Bible talks a lot about sacrifices, you know, from the very beginning. Uh, Genesis 3, 15, where we read there about how the, the woman's seed would bruise and probably even more literally crush the head of the serpent. You know, that, that talks there about how something is going to happen to make that all occur and what does happen is the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, you look at uh, Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel and the whole family engaged in sacrifices. We know that Cain or Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did and then that tends to be more perfected in the mosaical dispensation when you have different types of sacrifices that were offered but most of those still came down to the same thing. You're going to be looking at a, a holistic animal type sacrifice. And then the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so there you have the Passover Lamb in the form of Jesus Christ in a very spiritual yet physical sense as he was offered for us as a sacrifice. And when you think about that, that's, that is uh, an interesting type of of uh, study when you study about sacrifices. And if you look at the Old Testament, we might breathe a sigh of relief and say, well, I'm glad we're not under that right now, that we don't have to offer these animal sacrifices, go out and find a, uh, a heifer, or go out and find a bullock, or to go out and find a lamb and offer that. You know, I'm thankful for that. But how much more of a challenge is it to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, an ongoing sacrifice. A couple of things about sacrifices. One, the sacrifice is a, a holistic, and I mentioned that word before and I don't want to wear it out, 
but it is a total commitment when you think about a sacrifice. Uh, there's not anything that's left over other than that. It, it gives its entire being, the entire body is offered when you think about a sacrifice. When Abraham was given instructions concerning his son Isaac, uh, it was understood that he would be offering him his, his body, his son's body, as a burnt sacrifice. He even places his son there upon the wood and he's ready to plunge the sacrificial knife into his son's heart to steal his son's life as in quieting the heart from beating. He's ready to do that. And then as he's ready to do that, he's interrupted in his sacrificial procedure. And he's told, now, uh, you can uh, uh, be aware of the fact that there is a, a ram that's caught in the thicket, so you don't have to offer your son now. But he understood that was going to be a complete, a total offering. And that's how sacrifices are. And so it is with us today in Romans 12. We offer ourselves totally, don't we, to God. If I'm going to be a Christian, I'll be doing that totally. Another thing about a sacrifice, a sacrifice doesn't give instructions or directions. Whoever heard of a lamb speaking up and saying, here's the way I want to be offered on this altar, it doesn't do that. A sacrifice just says, here I am, take me, and as the song says, take my life and let it be, and we're totally consecrated, Lord, to thee. We're giving our set, my hands, my feet, uh, let them move at the impulse of thy love. You know, those things are mentioned in that song because that's what a sacrifice does. It, you're just totally to be used by our Father. And we don't tell our God and our Father how we're going to do things, but we simply have yielded and submitted ourselves to Him as we sing the song, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I'm waiting, yielded and still. And so that's the nature of sacrifices. And we think in terms of sacrifices, we understand too that, that as we think about our bodies being a living sacrifice, an ongoing thing, that we need to probably remind ourselves of that continually. This concept of reminding ourselves continually was born in the Bible. Because you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 9, talking about some things that people should remember about God's laws. He said you ought to even write those down, place them on your doorpost of your house. That's just a lot like today people maybe putting something on a bumper sticker or the uh, little bracelets that came out years ago, the WWJD bracelets. What would Jesus do? Uh, anything along that line uh, where we're reminding ourselves. Sometimes athletes will write notes down I remember years ago, uh, the great tennis player uh, Arthur Ashe used to would write a little note on the top of his tennis shoe, keep your feet moving, just stay focused, stay focused. And so uh, we need to write these things down in our heart that we want to present our body as a living sacrifice. And you think in terms also of sacrifice and think about worship. While worship is an act, and I don't mean like you're putting on an act, but it is something that we go and do Really, everything we do during the day, wherever we go, whatever we do, wherever we work, we're always mindful of the fact that we're presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. The next part of that verse, and you may be thinking, he's going to go through every verse in this chapter. I'm really not going to do that, I promise you. But the next part is also a resolution, and that is not to be conformed to this world. And another way that's been translated, I believe J.B. Phillips was the first one I remember reading doing this, where he said, don't let the world press you into its mold. When you think about the world, the way this is illustrated, he says, don't be conformed to the world, conformed. And then he goes on and he uses the word transformed. Have you ever thought about the difference between those two words? Well, we know the difference between conformed and transformed, but as far as original language is concerned. Conform comes from a Greek word that means schema, schema. And the word schema refers to how things change from time to time. Uh, you change. For example, many of you today, what you're wearing this morning, if you come back tonight, you won't be wearing the same thing. I know, I know, that's, and I do, I've done that before too. Uh, you may tend to just, maybe the men may not wear uh, the suit, the coat or something tonight if they come back. You've changed, the schema has changed. You change as a person. When I look at you as, as grown-ups, uh, you don't look like, like you did when you were, I, probably most of you, unless I knew you when you were a little boy or girl, I couldn't know that, that was you if I looked at a picture of you when you were three years old. Because the schema has changed over a period of time. 
That's the word he uses there when he talks about conformed. In other words, don't let the world just move you around and jerk you around to where the world is playing you. you where, the, where the tail is wagging the dog, in other words. But instead, be transformed. And there you have another word. That is morphe. Morphe is that unalterable, unchangeable essence inside of you that becomes that way through or by, dia in the original language, the renewing of your mind, making your mind new, and that, of course, through Jesus Christ. And so every day we remind ourselves as Christians, we are different from the world. We are different. We're different in the things that make us happy. Uh, we're different from the world and the drives that we have, the motives that we have in our life. They're not ulterior, but they are superior, and they are heavenly in nature. We have our affection set on things above, Colossians 3, 1 through 5. Uh, our thoughts are centered around Jesus Christ and are made captive to his will, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. And we think on the things that are pure and that are good and holy, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Now, blessed are the, the poor in spirit. We are individuals who uh, realize our need and our dependence on God, and we are pure in heart. So we're striving to be that way, Matthew 5 and verse 8. So that's one of our resolutions. We don't want to be conformed to the world. We want to stay away from anything that is worldly in nature as far as letting it drive our lives. And verse 9 of the same chapter, same thing, abhor what is evil. The world will tell you, first of all, the world would invite you to engage in what is evil, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, 1 John 2, 15. But as Christians, we understand that we are to abhor what is evil. That's illustrated so well in Joseph's life. You know, over there in Genesis 39 and verse 9, when Potiphar's wife is trying to entice and seduce him, and he says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, he put it in his proper perspective, didn't he? I'm not going to engage in the wickedness of this world. The world says, come on, just do it a little bit if you want to in the name of Satan. I don't want you to quit going to church. I don't want you to quit uh, singing songs of praise. I don't want you to quit taking the Lord's Supper. Just do it a little bit. Dance with me just a little bit, says the devil. Anytime you dance with the devil, he leads. And so as a Christian, we're challenged to not be conformed to this world. The third thing we're challenged with is in verse 3, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but think soberly. And another way we could look at that is watch out for sinful pride. Nothing wrong with pride. We all have some pride in different things, don't we? And for most of us speaking as a parent, we have pride in our children. And when our children have done something uh, that we just find notable, we want to tell everybody about it. And we realize that other people aren't as excited in our children as we are. <laughs> but still, they, well, they just have to hear about some of these things. No, nothing wrong with that. And we're proud of others from some things that they have accomplished over the years. Nothing wrong with that either. But the sinful pride is something that Jesus speaks out directly against by his Beatitudes when he says we need to have a poverty-stricken spirit. Tokos is what that word is. In the original language means I realize my total utter dependence on Almighty God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And so uh, I, I don't want to, uh, to look at myself as being better than others, but I want to think of myself as being one who uh, just to, I'm so thankful to be the recipient of God's mercy and God's grace. And I love everybody. And I never want to think of me as being better than anybody else. Also, he tells us in verse 6 that since we have gifts that are different, according to the grace that is given to us, let's use them, he points out. So use your talents for the Lord. Now there's an interesting word there that comes from, a, it's a word that we use today a lot, charisma. Charisma, and it's a Greek word, charismata. And that particular word is important as it relates to our study today. Now, what he's pointing out is something that we need to think of a different, at different times. Probably a lot of people here can do some mechanical work on cars. But you may not be an expert mechanic. Now, we may have someone here who is. I don't know. Some of you may be able to do a good job when it comes to some artistic things. And we have some here who are gifted in that particular area. I could work all day on a painting 
and if somebody's already put the numbers in on it and I can draw little things, I might make it look like something I guess you could turn in to a teacher. Gina Laguna, in her mind, can look at something and already have it already painted, and all she needs to do is go ahead and put the colors with it. So there's a difference there. Some things we can do and do okay with, and others have a gift in being able to do certain things. And that's what he's talking about here. He says every one of us, now watch this, every one of us are touched by God. We all have a gift from God. And he says, whatever that might be, then he goes ahead and gives you just a, a variety of what those gifts might be. He says some concerning prophecy. Now, we think of prophecy as foretelling, but often it's just teaching or preaching. Others might have a gift when it comes to, uh, to ministry, just helping out people, ministering. They have an eye for a situation like, I need to go take something to help these people out and then do it. They do it then. If you have that gift, he says, use that. For those who teach or who can just explain things, use that gift. There are some who can just pick you up and make your life go so much better through exhortation. May they speak out and tell people and encourage them and exhort them, he points out. He even talks about those who can give. There are individuals who have a, a gift of being able to have money that's come into them and they can use that and help others with it. If you have that, he says, use that. If you are a leader, use that gift with diligence. Some people are natural leaders. And there are some, uh, have you ever thought about mercy as being a gift? I don't hardly know how to separate the words mercy and grace and gift in the original language. They all come back to that word charis, which is part of charismatic, which means I've been touched by God and there are some people who have been touched by our Father in Heaven to have mercy. They're just filled with mercy. And as they think about others who are in difficult situations, their eyes are filled with tears. And you know that person has mercy on you and on others. Use that. That's a gift from God. You've been touched by our Father in Heaven. And as we look at the parable of the talents and the five and the two and one talent men in Matthew 25, everybody has something from God. Now, you may be a five-talent or a two-talent or a one-talent. Any way you look at it, you've been touched by our Father in Heaven. My New Year's resolution, then, one of those would be, I want to use whatever gift I have, if it's one, if it's two, if it's five, to the glory of God. I'm going to do that in the year of 2006. One of my preacher friends and I were talking about it the other day. <laughs> Can you think of anything real cute that goes with 2006? You know, be alive in 05 or something like that. That would work real well, but... Now, 06, we, don't, we can't think of too many things, but whatever I'm going to do in 06, and whatever rhymes with that that sounds spiritual and good, I want to use my talents for the Lord. I also want to be sincere. We're told in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Now, for those who uh, maybe are younger people or those who have not been Christians for a long time, uh, I want to take a moment to look at the word hypocrisy. The word hypocrisy is a, a word that, that means, if you look at the original language, of a play actor, someone who is an actor on a stage. And back, even in Bible times, they had plays. And so a person would be uh, you know, on a stage, and they would be acting in a certain way, and just like we can identify with that today, there are people who are actors. He says, don't be actors. <laughs> in other words, be sincere. The word sincere means without wax. It goes back to the craftspeople of back in the old New Testament days, Whenever they would have different items that they would produce, uh, the craft items, they would make sure that those were produced in a pure, good way without any kind of cracks and faults that would be found in those vessels that someone would take home with them and then the thing would just fall all apart because it wasn't made right. And so they would advertise their wares as being without wax, sincere. What you see is what you get. And so as a Christian... I'm going to be genuine this year. That's not to say I wasn't in the year 2005, but it is to say that I'm going to stay focused on that. I'm going to be sincere. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm also going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And that verse uh, has a parallel verse found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, where we are to love one another with a pure heart fervently, fervently, intensely, so I love my brothers and sisters, just like I have a love for my own physical brothers and sisters. I've always felt that it would be sad to have a family where brothers and sisters don't love each other like they should, physically speaking. 
but how sad it is also to think about being a part of God's family and not having an intense, fervent love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Every day, every night, let me pray about that. Lord, help me to love my brothers and sisters in Christ the way that you love them. I want to do the same thing. I want to have that kind of love for them. May the Father in heaven help me to do that very thing. And that means I will rejoice with them and will weep with them accordingly. As verse 15 says, easy sometimes to weep with those who weep, isn't it? You've heard about the death of a loved one. You call them up. Uh, you have tears in your eyes as you speak to them on the phone and you hurt with them. Sometimes not as easy to rejoice with those who rejoice. Somebody got a FEMA check in, three times larger than yours was. You've not even heard from your insurance adjuster yet. And so you're supposed to rejoice with those people who rejoice? Of course you do. You rejoice. And you're thankful that good things can happen to good people. Now for me, I always, I'm thankful because sometimes I, I hear so much of the negative, and, and that's part of life. We realize the sicknesses and deaths, and so it's always good when somebody calls and says, I've got some good news, you know. So we rejoice. And we're thankful when good things happen to our brothers and sisters. And also we weep with them when they are hurting. And then we remember to put others first. Back years ago, there was a wonderful ministry called the Joy Bus Ministry. The busing ministry was one of the most fabulous things we ever did in the Lord's Church. And there are some who were converted during that time. I know we have at least one lady here this morning who was converted because of bus ministry. We praise our Father in Heaven for that. And uh, my wife worked on it extensively when she was a teenage girl. And they had what they called joy buses, and that stood for Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. And so, others before yourself. And that's a wonderful slogan, but it should be a part of our life. And that's what he says right here, to, in honor, give preference to one another. Now, if we give preference to one another as one of our New Year's resolutions, don't worry about keeping up with all these. They're all in Romans 12. If we do that, truly it will bless our lives in every aspect. If you think in terms of, of the work that, that you might do, working with one another, uh, what would it be like if all employers and employees prefer one another uh, more than they do themselves? They give honor to one another. Uh, what it would be like in the home? Amazing, wouldn't it? You know, husbands and wives... And sons and daughters, moms and dads, everybody doing that and giving honor to one another and preferring one another. And of course, in the Lord's church, how wonderful it would be. And also, as we sing in the song about serving the Lord, I want to be a worker for the Lord in the year of 2006. Serving the Lord. There's no way to even begin to think of all the ways that we can serve the Lord. You can fill in the blanks on that. Whether it comes to helping out people, ministering to people, handing out Bible tracts, doing Bible studies, cleaning the building, taking food to individuals, whatever it might be, reading scripture, saying prayers, working for the Lord. Serving the Lord has a phrase that goes with it that just about always accompanies serving the Lord that was in the New Testament days, serving the time. Paul picks up on that in Ephesians 5, 16, where he talks about redeeming the time. We realize time means opportunities, and the opportunities I have, I don't want to let them go. I want to seize those opportunities and be a worker for the Lord. I want to also be filled with hope, verse 12, rejoicing in hope. We have the one hope, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, but that hope is heaven. That's an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved for us. May we always keep that on our mind at all times. And then we want to treat others right, even if sometimes we may not be treated right. And those verses that deal with that, verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. 17 through 21, repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Don't avenge yourselves, give place to wrath. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay him. So if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head or make him think or her think about the fact that I need to treat this person kinder because look how good they've been to me. I'm thinking of Matthew 7, 12, and, and I'm realizing that this is going to be my year to apply that more than ever that I'm going to treat people in the way I'd like to be treated, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. So I'm going to treat others right. And then finally, don't forget to pray. As it tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 12, steadfastly 
in prayer. Don't forget to pray. This morning we're praying that if there's anyone here, uh, let's just think about the setting of where we are. This is the first Sunday of the year, first day of the year. Wouldn't it be wonderful if right now you were already thinking in terms of obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ for you to seize that opportunity and become a New Testament Christian? Wouldn't that be great? This would be a wonderful time to do that, to, uh, to have trust in Jesus Christ. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, to turn away from your sins, to be willing to tell people that you love Jesus, and then to be baptized into Christ to complete your obedience for the remission of sins. That's not some Church of Christ doctrine. I'm not aware of any Church of Christ doctrine. Uh, this is Bible teaching for the remission of sins. Or if you need to come back to the Lord, to, to be restored to His service, just like last week or two weeks ago we had that. Uh, if that's what you need, uh, this would be a precious time that God has given to you. This is a year of our Lord. It belongs to Him. Let's take advantage of that. Let's give our life to our Lord this year. If you need to respond to our precious Lord's invitation, with all the love in our heart, we do invite you to come to our Jesus now as we stand and as we sing together.